Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Hello, welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church, Hanley on YouTube. I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley in this video. I'm continuing to look at the series of old works of Scottish theology, the Cunningham Lectures. And we've really come right towards the end of this series of videos. I've decided that we shall close this series with the 1950s. It's amazing to think, particularly for someone my age, that the 1950s are so far in the past now that 1954, when the volume that we're looking at today, when the, these lectures were delivered, is now some over 60 years, 65 years in our past. But the volume we're looking at in this video is Only One Way Left by George MacLeod, MCDD. Looking at these old lectures, some of them are delivered by quite well-known people, some by people who are not known at all. George F. MacLeod was certainly well-known. He was a personality, shall we say. George Field and MacLeod came from the establishment. If ever there was a man of the establishment, it was he. He was born 17th of June 1895 in Glasgow, where his father, John MacLeod, who was to become Sir John MacLeod, Baronet, was a leading businessman. His mother was a daughter of the Fielden family of Lancashire industrialists. His grandfather was the famous Reverend Norman MacLeod, D.D. This is the memoir of Norman MacLeod, D.D. by his brother Donald MacLeod, who was again a Church of Scotland minister. Norman MacLeod was one of the great leaders of the party who did not leave the Church of Scotland in 1843. He was a Glasgow minister, as was his brother, and together they ministered to that great industrial city. As I say, George MacLeod was born in 1895, and being very much a member of the establishment, one must remember that the MacLeods, well, of course, the, the, I mean, the family go back to the Isle of Skye, and the MacLeods, particular branch that he belonged to, were pillars of the Scottish establishment. Unlike the Fieldons, who were Unitarians, the MacLeods were Church of Scotland and proud of it. With the establishment background, with the money, George MacLeod was sent down to England for education. That was quite normal for sons of the Scottish aristocracy and the higher gentry, if you will that they would not send their sons to the schools of Scotland, but to the schools in England, the great boarding schools. And George MacLeod went to Winchester College. Winchester College is a great boarding school that's attached to Winchester Cathedral. It's a very Anglican, very Church of England. Following his course at Winchester, he went on to Oxford, where he was a student, entered at Oriel College, the same college that John Henry Newman, generations before, had been a part of. But then, in 1914, the First World War broke out. Your country needs you. And those men studying at Oxford and Cambridge, they were the officer class, if you will. Certainly. George MacLeod was officer class. There was a, a noblesse oblige. These young men were expected to lead the country. And the young men led the country from the front. They became 
junior officers, the army lieutenants, the army captains, and they were the men who, in overwhelming numbers, laid down their lives in Flanders fields. George MacLeod saw many of his friends die. He served in Greece, and then in that awful mud-soaked Flanders fields area of the war, the Western Front. He suffered, as so many in his generation did, from the diseases that came with the trenches, that came with primitive sanitary conditions. He served with the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders and rose to the rank of captain, winning the military cross for his bravery. The war ended, and he, with many other young men, not just officers, but also men who were NCOs and private soldiers, was exercised with a feeling that his calling was now to serve in the church, to serve in the ministry of the church. He was a Scotsman. His grandfather had been a Church of Scotland minister. He had relatives in the Church of Scotland, and so he proceeded to Edinburgh and the divinity course there at the university. He proceeded then, in 1921, he crossed the Atlantic and spent a year studying in America. There were some things about America he didn't like, he said afterwards that spending a year in America made him a monarchist, a decided one. Make of that what you will. He studied at Union Theological Seminary, then as now the vanguard of theological modernism. And he returned to Scotland, where he became assistant minister at St Giles, the High Kirk, in the centre of Edinburgh, the most important church in the whole country. But also he became involved in efforts that sprang from the First World War. The First World War had seen many attempts, many efforts by the church to provide fellowship, comradeship and rest to the weary soldiers. One of them was Talbot House, Toc H as it became known, led by the charismatic and formidable Anglican minister, Tubby Clayton. And Clayton kept something together after the war, trying to continue, in fact, Toc H continues to this day, trying to continue some sort of fellowship with pa padres, chaplains, and bases in various parts of England, including in Scotland. That's not just England then, but also in Scotland. And among the men who were recruited to help with this was a young minister, George MacLeod. But George MacLeod was a Scotsman and a Church of Scotland minister, and his ordination was Presbyterian. And this meant that the High Anglicans had a problem with him. They didn't want, the, didn't want Presbyterians to be admitted to communion. And this created a barrier in terms of the Anglicans and MacLeod. MacLeod felt that he was being called upon to compromise. He also felt that Clayton was being called on to compromise his ecumenical ideals in the name of peace with Anglicans who had absolutely no sympathy at all with any sort of ecumenism. And so in 1926 he left Toc H, and he became the, the Associate Minister of St Cuthbert's Parish Church, Edinburgh. So, again, he was in this team ministry set up, this great big church, and he was one of the ministers. He was in Edinburgh, he saw the slums, he saw the, the problems, the social problems, he developed a great social concern. He'd been concerned for his men in the trenches. He had this same concern for the poor of Scotland. Some of it was paternalism. Of course it was paternalism. Look at his background. But he moved in a, a consistently left-wing direction, becoming at last a 
full-blown socialist of a type. In 1930 he was called to govern Old Parish Church and govern Old Parish Church, the name suggests it was the Old Parish, the building actually was quite modern, it had been rebuilt well within living memory, in fact in the, I think it was in the 1890s. Sadly the building's closed now, it's, uh, it has ceased to be, but in MacLeod's day it was packed and it was at Govan that he published his first volume, his first book, Govan Calling. It's a fascinating volume to read, actually. Sermons and Addresses, broadcast and otherwise, by George F. MacLeod. Published, first published, November the 29th, 1934. And you've got such subjects as Christ and Patriotism, Christ and Modernity, Babel and Pentecost, things not worth dying for. The only Christ and the average man concerning walking tours and the Church of Scotland in search of her youth. It has been one of the great problems of the last century is what do you do with the youth? He threw himself into the work at Govan and very soon caused a breakdown. 1932 he had a total breakdown. He had to take a whole year off work and more. In 1933 he was in Jerusalem as part of his recovery after the breakdown and he attended an Easter Day service at one of the Orthodox churches there. In the course of this he had a, a mystical experience that would transform him, at least that's how he saw it, it would transform him, his preaching, his view of the church, particularly the church as the corporate body of Christ. His social concerns were also very important to him and during that period in the 1920s, 1930s he became a decided pacifist. It's notable that it wasn't in the immediate aftermath of the war. Rather his problem, as with quite a number of other men who became pacifists at the same time, was that they had believed that the war would change everything. They believed in this idea that politicians were speaking of uh, toward the end of the war and the immediate aftermath of it, that this would now be a time to build a world fit for heroes, a country fit for heroes, instead of which there was austerity, financial crisis, economic collapse, mass unemployment. And MacLeod was one of the men who said, well, if the war accomplished nothing in terms of these things that we were told it would accomplish, does war accomplish anything? And he was one of those who concluded well, it doesn't, and therefore we should all be pacifists. He was also one of the men who was faced with the challenge of Hitler in the 1930s and the challenge of the Second World War. What to do? It strained his pacifism, and quite rightly so, because Hitler is one of the great challenges to dogmatic pacifism. What do you do about a Hitler? if you're a dogmatic pacifist. In 1938, to resume our chronological survey of his life, in 1938 he joined a movement to rebuild the old abbey on the island of Iona. And he saw this as the, the founding not just of a historical monument rebuild, that would make no sense, but building rather a community within the Church of Scotland, the great emphasis of which would be to do with the training of the ministry. And so was born the Iona community. It's changed radically since MacLeod's day. MacLeod sought to be somewhat ecumenical in that. He would admit really any Christian, anyone who confessed Christ to the communion, for example. He had a long-running argument with the minister of Iona, who did not like this strange bunch of people who seemed to him to be playing at being monks. George MacLeod would later disabuse everyone of the idea that he was playing at being a monk by getting married. MacLeod's role involved fundraising, and there's a wonderful story in the official biography of MacLeod. This is, this is it. This is Ronald Ferguson, George MacLeod, founder of the Iona community. And there he is with Ione in the background. Now the interesting thing about this book, it's a great, great book to read. It's over 400 pages. 
but it's over 400 pages of a very full life. Now, McLeod and I differ on many, many points, and it's often quite helpful to read the biography of someone you disagree with. But one of the incidents recorded is to do with fundraising. McLeod went to a Scottish industrialist, a Glasgow industrialist, and asked for a contribution of several thousand pounds. The industrialist had also fought as a junior officer in the First World War, had also won, had also been awarded the Military Cross for his valour and bravery. So these were, were two combat veterans of the First World War. Each of them knew that the other was entitled to wear the same medals. And one of them became a pacifist, MacLeod, the other had not. The other, in fact, the industrialist, was involved in the manufacture of warships. And so the industrialist said to MacLeod, look, if I give you this money that you're asking for, and I say your condition, the condition for this, my condition for this is that you must give up pacifism, will you give up pacifism? And MacLeod replied, not on your life. At which point the industrialist said, the industrialist said let me get my checkbook. Because, you see, the industrialist realised... Here's a man with principles. You don't give money to a man without principles asking for money because, you know, the kind of man who robs you blind. But if you've got a man who stands what, with his principle and says, I'd rather hold my principle than get money, you can trust him with the money. MacLeod had great trouble with the Second World War. He served as a number of Younger ministers then had been called up, had been called to become chaplains in the military. So he served as locum in the Canongate Kirk during the war. He later left the Iona community, or rather the Iona community left him when he retired. But in 1967 he was awarded a peerage. He died on the 27th of June 1991. As I said, he was a socialist. He was an unashamed socialist. He was described by some as being halfway to Moscow, which was not fair, because Moscow stood for totalitarian communism, and the one thing that MacLeod would never be in favour of was totalitarian communism. Yes, he could be a totalitarian in the Iona community, but he was a military officer treating the, the men as though they were, well, his men. In terms of his religious beliefs, and particularly his ceremonial, he was described as being halfway to Rome, which probably wasn't fair either. Certainly he did not like the Roman Catholic Church because he felt it wasn't ecumenical enough. So that's George MacLeod, a strange man in many ways. His other, other notable book is this one, Speaking the Truth in Love, The Modern Preacher's Task. Again, 1930s, um, 1936, which was published, it was the uh, Preacher's Lectureship, the Warwick Lectures at Edinburgh University. So, George MacLeod. But then, of course, our real subject here is this book, Only One Way Left. There's a pun in the title. First of all, George MacLeod was a socialist. And, of course, socialists are on the political left. So, Only One Way Left refers not merely to his conviction that there's only one way open for the church to go, but also that there's only one way in which the society, society particularly in Scotland, in which the, the world rebuilding after the Second World War, can go left in terms of political socialism. He had seen, the whole world had seen, a false way of going left, that is to say the going left of the Soviet bloc totalitarian communism and that he rejected this is a fascinating book i really enjoyed reading it i politically i'm very different from mcleod i'm not a socialist and mcleod religiously seems to me to be far too ecumenical i'm not an ecumenist either but it's a really good book to read because mcleod had a very good mind and so he opens up for example questions about democracy what, what is democracy how does it work um how how do we work a democratic society? And he says one of the problems is that modern man is half-baked, like a cake not turned. 
modern man's religious thought, it just isn't there. And the problem with democracy is that democracy requires a full man. And if you've got half-baked men voting, then the question is, what are they voting for? Are they voting for something that is full-orbed or not? He warns us not to take parliamentary democracy for granted. He reminds us, I think it's a wonderful point, he says, let us not forget that Britain is never, in fact, governed by Labour or Conservatives. Britain is governed by the Houses of Parliament. The Prime Minister is a salaried official of the state, but the Leader of the Opposition is also salaried. He is correctly the Leader of Her Majesty's Opposition, Checks and Balances. Listening to people on both sides. And I say, so reading this in the the climate of the current political turmoil in the United States of America, the one looks back, and, and when I post this, it'll be the day before the inauguration of the next US president, and who knows what we, we shall see, but we know this, that God is in control. And I, I can only think that if both sides were closer to, to McLeod, I, I'm not a socialist, he was a socialist. He has this rather the good statement about socialism, where he says, basically, for him, socialism means planning first, then freedom. For me, political, for want of a better word, a good old-fashioned liberalism, the liberalism of Spurgeon, means freedom first, then planning. But freedom is necessary. Freedom is vital, but the church, where does the church go from here? And again, it's a great question that we have to ask. There's only one way left for the church. The church cannot try to be an authority that enforces itself upon the world. We have only one voice. And we have only one leader, one commander, and that is Christ. And we listen to Christ, who is for us, the prophet, priest, and king. Christ is the prophet. He is the one who speaks for God, and the church must speak his prophetic words. Christ is the priest who ministers in the midst of the congregation, who sanctifies his church, and Christ is the king who rules in the church. And so it is that we must live, and so we must remember that Christianity is the most relevant thing in the world. And the task of the church is to bring us to Christ, to bring people to Christ. It is not to make Christ acceptable to the church. He tells of his experience in the United States, where he, he felt that the great message of the mainline church was about adapting ourselves to the present world not about adapting the present world to Christ. The church is not about adapting to the present world. Now, in terms of how we communicate, in terms of the language that we use, that's another matter. But in terms of the way we think, we cannot adapt to the world. But we must be, we cannot be conformed to the world, but we must be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So, it's a stimulating book. That I'll say that, it's a stimulating book. I could go on for hours. I'm not going to. So, thank you for watching, and may God bless you and keep you and help you to live for Christ in the midst of this confusing world. Amen.